You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is focused on tariff liberalization. And so the Continental Free Trade, that is the aim, boosting into African trade. Because the rules of origin hasn't been fully ready, you cannot trade completely. And it's going to help us reduce an estimated $5 billion, about 80% of transfers go throughout of Africa before it comes back to Africa. So I decided to set up the network, put all professionals together. Currently, we are about 20,000 plus across the globe. We are going to lead the private space and then make sure that some of the opportunities will be reaped way ahead of time. Stay tuned as we bring you inspiring people who are unlocking Africa's economic potential. You're listening to the Unlocking Africa podcast with your host, Tessa Adamu. Welcome to the Unlocking Africa podcast, where we find brilliant people who are doing brilliant things to unlock Africa's economic potential. Today, we have Louis Afol, who is Group Executive Director of the After Policy Network Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Lewis. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm very, very well. And hello to all your, your listeners. Thank you. I'm extremely excited about today's conversation as it's an area that's extremely current, it's topical and has huge importance for the future development of Africa. So I was wondering before we start, can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about who Lewis Afool is? Uh, Lewis is a trade practitioner and focus more on after expertise and the private sector development. Lewis has focused much more on developing the sensitization advocacy of the African continental free trade area. Um, executive director of APN Group that is made up of after Policy Network, the first and the largest think tank on continental free trade, Women of Africa Network, and then the Africa Globalized Investment Summit. I think I've been over 10 years previously in the ECESL, um, a retail company as a finance director, and also been on several boards. My focus will be to look at how the youth of Africa will benefit from the African continent of free trade. Brilliant. So you've given us a great overview of who you are, what your focus is, and the types of activities that you've been involved in. Obviously, your main focus is on AFTA, so the African Continental Free Trade Area, which is very current, very topical, and there's so many different facets or functions or areas that make up this agreement. So AFTA Where do we start, Lewis? I think that the African continental free trade area was previously called the CFTA, the Continental Free Trade Area. And when the heads of state signed, it was changed to Africa Continental Free Trade Area because the agreement now gave opportunity for it to become a free trade area. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is focused on tariff liberalization among 54 countries in Africa who want to intra-trade. So we call it the boosting intra-African trade. The focus is to liberalize 90% of their products or tariff lines and take some time over a period of five years, 10 years, and 15 years. Then also you have 10% that is not going to be liberalized, which is 7% sensitive product and 3% exclusive product. These 7% sensitive products are products that are aimed at hedging and protecting growing up companies in various member states. And then the 3% will not be negotiated or liberalized in any moment now because they form core part of products that are not ready to be liberalized to safeguard uh, most of the member states from undue, undue revenue losses. Yes. And so the continental free trade, that is the aim, boosting into African trade and liberalizing tariffs. And so the proponents of the agreement looked at what we call phases of the agreement. And every phase had protocols, which are very important. They are the spirit of the agreement. And so you look at it, phase one was looking at what we call trading goods, trading services, and then what we call the dispute settlements. 
which is very, very key. This was done, and this is emotion, active now. And then phase two also, also looked at intellectual property rights, competition policy, and then investment. That is still being negotiated. And then phase three was to look at digital trade. However, there's one more protocol that is also under consideration, that is women and youth in development or in trade. Out of the first phase, that is the trading rules, it has so many annexes which have been completed. And the trading rules, you are looking at the rules of origin and the rules of origin, which is the spirit of driving the agreement. Because how would you be able to determine that a product is an African origin? Yes. So the rules of origin, which is about 80%, the current is about 90% ready. They had to sort out the value additions agreement side. When that is done, it will be published in, as a whole book, and member states will have it at their custom corporation and management. That is very, very important. And so trading goods, you, you have a lot that has been done. Apart from the rules of origin, which forms part of the annexes, you have trading trade facilitation, and then you also have issues that have to do with customs and border management. Another key area is that you have under trading goods, the free movement of people, yes. which was built upon the Abuja Treaty of 1991 to allow, you know, built upon the prototype of the ECOWAS, to allow people to move freely with their goods. That must be done. It's been currently uh, uh, under, uh, uh, it's been built upon because uh, it's taking some time. Another key area that is very, very important we have to know is that under trade in services, Trading services focuses on 12 priority areas, or we call them the 12 uh, ambitious commitments, or we call it the, uh, uh, the commitments or special uh, offers. The 12 under trading services, which is also liberalized. Currently, five is running, that's with about seven. I'm breaking it because it's very important we understand how to operate. The trade in services has tourism, which has been liberalized. Yes. You have um, const- you have uh, ICT, you have professional bodies, you have um, you have um, financial institutions, and then you have transport. These five have been liberalized. In other words, they are operational. The other seven, which is not yet done, is looking at areas very important like education, you're looking at sports, creative arts, you're looking at health. All the rest must be negotiated quickly because the World Bank estimated about 50% of our GDP was coming from the service industry. And so if you have trading service as part of boosting to African trade, then we need to develop those service offers. The difference is that unlike trading goods where it's going to go according to border and rules of origin, there is no rules of origin for the trading service. It's going to be built upon national interest offer and acceptance. Having said that, the agreement started trading last year. It's almost two years now. And so far, uh, because the rules of origin hasn't been fully ready, you cannot trade completely. And so uh, you have some activities ongoing in terms of the secretariat putting a lot of operationalization structures together. You have custom management and operations putting structures together. Because remember, we are at the first stage of an African market, that is the free trade. And so we are not a custom union yet. And so the agreement is building upon, the agreement is building upon the RECs the regional economic blocks that have been in existence for some time. The African continental free trade, so far you have about 54 countries that have signed. How do you become a member? You have to sign the agreement, then you have to let your parliament ratify, and then after ratification, you submit the letters of ratification to the African Union Commission. That makes you a full member and you benefit from trading. Now, let me emphasize, if you have not completed the third stage of membership, you will not benefit from the 
tariff concessions. You know, benefit from the um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, yes, the, the the tariff concessions or the preferential treatment. So the agreement is based upon preferential treatment. Therefore, currently we have about 54 countries who have signed, but you're looking at about 44 plus who are full-scale members. And the rest, work is being done on them for them uh, full-time. But there's going to be a kind of arrangement where the what we call application system. The application system is going to allow those who are not full members to apply for some time, to be able to engage in the uh, uh, trading with full-time members. The agreement, actually, uh, which one of the important things I want us to uh, know is that liberalization takes different phases. We have categorized um, countries into three categories, developed economies, developing economies, and the least developed among the African economy when it comes to ESCFT. So that the first group, developed economies, have pledged and signed to liberalize over a period of five years, whilst the developing will liberalize over a period of 10 years. In other words, they will be reducing their tariffs onto zero tariffs at the end of those years. Then the group of six, we call them, they are the ones that are really uh, very least developed. They are going to have to develop, uh, with, um, what do you call it, liberalize over a period of 15 years. That is how the structure is. And because you know, once you start liberalizing, uh, your major uh, sources of revenue will be hampered a bit. In order to cushion that, the appraising bank has been taxed to support supply of credits, or offer credits to countries that are going to struggle over the first two years. The African continental free trade is not working in isolation, it's working with several other bodies, appraising bank, Africa Development Bank, the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, yes. which is called the PAPS, which is key. It is now the settlement uh, system of payment for traders, business people across member states. In other words, you don't you don't need to denominate or exchange in dollars before you transfer. You can transfer your money to another buyer or supplier in the, your own local currency and they'll receive it in your local currency over a period of about 10 seconds. And it's going to help us reduce a, an estimated 50, an estimated $5 billion that always about 80% of transfers go through out of Africa before it comes back to Africa. We pay for that. That is a milestone for the continental free trade. Brilliant. The continental free trade finally is built upon what we call BIAT, Boosting into African Trade. These are the pillars that indicate what and how AFTA is being implemented. And so if you walk to a country, these pillars I'm going to talk about will give you the signal that yes, this is AFTA being implemented. Or if you were to have a leak, how will country be performing? We use what we call the BIAT, Boosting to African Trade. A quick run through will be one of them is trade finance, trade policy, trade related infrastructure, trade information, market segmentation, and then what we call the factor productivity. These make up what we call, and trade facilitation, these make up what we call the BIAT, boosting into African trade. Under them, you have so many sub, sub, sub implementation strategies. Thank you, Lewis. You've given us a very comprehensive overview of AFDA, its history, and the different phases. Coming closer to the work you do, in order to support after you've set up the largest international members network of professionals who are focused specifically on African continental free trade, can you tell us a bit about the network? Why was it set up and what you aim to achieve through the network? In fact, when I was part of the consultative aspects before the agreement was passed, yes, I was focused on private sector and payments. And then my expertise, we offered, at the time they engaged private sector in their negotiations. Currently it's government to government. Yes. And so we offered our expertise. Now, when we were done with our assignment, I looked into Africa and I realized that apart from the African Union, which agency was the after secretary, they were not ready yet. They were not having their staff put together yet. If you come back to Ghana, 
all ministries of trade are the supervising agencies to ensure the implementation of AFTA. I also came to realize that our ministry was not ready. So I decided to set up the network, put all professionals together. Currently, we are about 20,000 plus across the globe. Oh, wow. Yes, of professionals who I said, my vision was to engage them to participate, offer their services, wherever you find yourself remotely, in contributing to after, how you can position yourself to benefit from after, how you can reshape after. Because the agreement says after five years, you can go for review. So I put together this network and we started in fast sensitization and advocacy in Ghana and in most parts of Africa using webinars, television, media, radio, print to explain what after is and the benefit. Today, I can say that most of the CSOs that have come who are established in Ghana, or most of them passed through our hands. Most of their leaders passed through our hands. Some of them really have been our members, our members, and we are happy that they are developing that way. In fact, at one time, the Minister of Trade asked us to have an umbrella of all CSOs on after. And so that was the vision. And currently, we are the, we, we have taken that uh, fast track implementation strategy. We don't want to wait for the secretariat. We're always bureaucratic. So what we are doing is that we are still on with our research, advocacy, and sensitization, but we've moved up a bit by establishing a subsidiary called the Women of Africa Network. I've brought together almost some of the top women entrepreneurs, leaders together. Some of them have about 3,000 networks under them so that we can push for the women in trade protocol and help the women of Africa to benefit from the after. So then the third one, which is very passionate to me, is the uh, Africa private, Af the Africa globalized investment. You know, investment is part of after. So we decided to put together an investment program event every year. And this one is rotational. We move from country to country in the African countries so that I bring investors within Africa and outside Africa to come and invest in priority sectors of the various economies. And so we started from Ghana. This year, we are hoping to do it in Seychelles. We are already in talks with their government because we want the economies to open up. And so this is what the network has been doing. And we will still continue to do that. We, we've, we've, we've featured a lot of interviews, a lot, a lot, almost global. And also, we've also done a lot of programs with institutions, academia. But without academia, it will be difficult for it to be sustained. So we've done a lot with uh, local uh, tertiary institutions and out, um, foreign institutions. That is what APN has been doing. And we will still continue to do that. Thank you for that, Lewis. So, you know, you've given us an overview of how and why you started the network and the different activities that you've been involved to drive the AFTA strategy. Earlier on, you mentioned trading under AFTA started or kicked off was the 1st of January 2021. From your point of view, what has AFTA achieved since then? In fact, uh, this question that I've gone to the AFTA secretary, who are the uh, African Union body, but as a private sector, which makes us part of an ownership of this agreement, Currently, I think that, like I said earlier, in terms of how many companies have traded, I don't think we can get more than five, which is not good. Why? Because the agreement, the rules of origin, is not 100 percent ready. Yes. And they are looking that by the end of July, they will have to uh, launch that rules of origin. So currently, in terms of trading, intra-African trade, free trade, I can boldly say that you wouldn't have more than five. But a lot of activity, sensitization, advocacy, have gone in, um, especially, I uh, must uh, commend the Secretary General of AFTA, His Excellency Menewan Kelly, for good work, trying to get all those who have not ratified to ratify, trying to get a lot of trade facilitation, uh, uh, especially infrastructure development, trying to get, uh, what do you call it, funding for what we call, we call it the uh, Adjustment Facility Fund, it's about to help member states, private sector companies, who want to export and after to really get the benefit. And also he has been able to secure about $1 billion to support SMEs in Africa. And so they are going to support financial institutions within member states. Then Afriasian Bank is also doing a lot because uh, uh, building a lot of infrastructure, uh, taking out some of the salaries of the secretariat, 
and a lot of pro funding a lot of programs. And so these other uh, operational activities around after is really ongoing and it's really doing well. Fantastic. So, you, you know, you've mentioned the rules of origin and trading has not yet got going, but in the background, there's some fantastic work being done to put in place the infrastructure to enable it to get going in the not so distant future. As someone who is slightly on the outside looking in, which most people are, how can we go about to support the implementation of the strategies needed to positively progress after? I think that we must all take the boost in the traffic and trade very, very important. Yes. Every country is supposed to at least restructure its budget lines to develop all the key indicators I gave you. If we take infrastructure, if you are not going to even be able, you have to go into joint projects. Ghana, for example, wanted to expand its railway to a certain point. But when the coming of after Ghana is looking beyond Ghana to Burkina, why don't Burkina also do joint until we get to the car? The same applies to the East African regions, landlocked countries, and then coastal countries. What can they do together? So infrastructure can be joint and finance jointly. The other thing also has to do, we have to harmonize our registration, product registration, whereby you don't go to Nigeria and have a different product registration and come to Ghana and struggle along the borders, cross border. We should have a harmonized registration system and product. And that, to that effect, I think that project has started because our freezer mass has built a kind of um, what we call the uh, assurance, quality assurance facility. Yeah, I, I think they're almost ready, whereby product will undergo international certification standards uh, because sometimes you our product are rejected when we are supporting outside Africa based upon all manner of uh barriers technical yeah. barriers and whatnot so it will be redirected back to africa for uh for standards and it will help reply the uh, the product back to african market again uh you know we i think we are urging the secretary not to focus so much on funding from outside because yes. when you keep depending upon funding from outside africa then we go back to this, the, the activities like the Bretton Woods institutions. They give you conditions and tailored programs, which might not be fitting the original traditional vision of after. True. And I'm, I'm very happy that uh, one of the $1 billion have been secured to support automobile industry. And one of the biggest clauses is that that company must be truly African. This is what is going. So we are looking at joint support, joint projects among mm -hmm. governments, private sector, public-private sector initiatives. This is how to drive some of the programs of after. Fantastic. So you mentioned there about harmonizing product registration systems, joint project and support, and some of the barriers faced within after. From your point of view, you know, so far, which countries have established the necessary customs infrastructure for trading since after kicked off? In fact, I'll, I'll not be biased, but let me use my own country. Ghana. <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> we, we, we have really expanded our port, what we call the Terminal 3. The Terminal 3 uh, has, uh, I mean, the terms of the, uh, the expert didn't know how to capture, but we it's increased a lot of volume of trade a day, containers that come to the port, that we call the Terminal 3, a huge infrastructure. You look at our, our aviation infrastructure, Terminal 3 also, it was to boost a lot of flights, no fleets, then we have built an inland port, which uh, is yet to be um, launched. The energy side, we've expanded a lot. And so we, we are looking at Ghana's case studies. In fact, in any case, Ghana is helping uh, some other five countries to develop strategy around after. If you look at our case, we have taken these infrastructure very serious. We are also building a lot of soft infrastructure when it comes to IT. Yes. Uh, especially what we call our information bureau or what we call the uh, local uh, information observatory so that it will feed a lot of information related to trade and the after uh, which product Ghana is liberalized, which products are not liberalized. And again, we've also added a lot of soft infrastructure when it comes to our uh, single windows. We, you, we, you move, we go to our um, custom offices and custom port and you see um, after 
uh, product given a code in, through our single windows. Most countries, excuse me, most countries have not done that. So they don't even know which product is an after product and which product is not an after product. And I think those are things that need to be resolved. When Ghana, you are bringing a product, we know the uh, harmonization codes, which goes for what an after product is, what after. These are infrastructure that has been really built because we want to. Uh, and then again, even the whole secretariat building itself was given by Ghana as a, as a as part of the conditions and our seed. And we also offered about $10 million as an initial seed to support the secretariat after they were giving them the building. And I know other countries are also pushing hard, especially if you go to Kenya, if you go to Nigeria, if you go to Cote d'Ivoire, if you go to Rwanda. And yes. then I think if you will go to uh, uh, Ethiopia. So uh, Cairo is also doing very well when it comes to infrastructure. But I'm looking at coordinated effort, joint projects. Thank you for the overview of, you know, Ghana's progress with AFTER and the work that Ghana is doing to support the Secretariat. You mentioned earlier that Africa has already regional economic communities such as ECOWAS. So with the emergence of AFTER, how do you see these RECs operating alongside AFTER? One important thing is that the whole agreement says that they are not to work in isolation with the RECs. AFTER is to build upon what the RECs have been established for. Without the RECs, AFTER can be useless. Yes. Because before the after, we had ECOWAS. Yes. And after was also built upon a prototype of most of these wrecks. ECOWAS, after actually, if you look at after the business part of after, it was really built upon ECOWAS. If you're going to look at the customs, it was built upon the SADIC. Yes. And so we have to acknowledge that the wrecks keep building in up like a pyramid. And then after keep coming back to the wrecks to ensure that whatever that they have ratified, they are implementing. Because um, a key example is that the AFTA is a supra agreement so that all RECs, uh, negotiation RECs, activities RECs, pacts will flow under an umbrella of the AFTA so that there will not be that kind of opposing forces where AFTA is recommending this criteria for export and then a rec is also demanding an opposite. No, we have reached a stage where these have been harmonized and all. And it is saying that let us also respect the existing protocols that uh, were being implemented by this rec. So it is one, and a built upon one, two, it's collaboration and coordination. And then three, the after is an umbrella from which flows all these recs activities. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Thank you for highlighting, I guess, the link and agreement between the Rex and AFTER. And obviously, a key objective of AFTER is the stimulation or the development of business within Africa and intra-Africa trade. From your point of view, what does AFTER mean for African businesses? That is a very important uh, question. The overall idea is for us to export and import. Yes. It's for us to build the regional value chains. It's to stop us from exporting our raw materials, which the rest of the world needs so much from Africa, except ourselves. We need to have value to the raw materials. Adding value is identifying the product and identifying the respective extractive stage of that resources. Business people cannot add value to it and export within the African market. We have always said the African market is looking at 1.2 billion plus. So therefore, if you couldn't export uniforms, school uniforms to Ghana or Nigeria before, after, now you can do it because the agreement says that if Nigeria is ready to go to welcome garments or textiles, you should be able to export freely without any trade barriers. You couldn't export that outside Africa. Secondly, to business people, the cost of export ratio has gone down the cost of exporting outside Africa, when you could look at the market here, will go down. That will enable you to plow back your resources into more employment or facilities. Payment systems, you don't need hard cash, hard currency to do. An African payment system is there, settlements. Again, to businesses, it's important to identify that the agribusiness will still hold about 50% of the, 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 the benefit of after. 
So you can look at product by product vibrations, product by product um, value chains, and then develop. Yes. You can also look at ICT. ICT has been liberalized. ICT has been liberalized. So you can also look at the volume, the Silicon Valleys of Africa. Professional bodies, you are not left out. If you cannot get a medical job in Ghana or Nigeria, you can go to any of the liberalized economies of Africa to get a job there. This is what is to the business, to the youth. Yes. You need to put up your ideas, your concepts into reality. What is it that you have to take the pains of searching these African markets? What is being needed I can do? For example, if I were a youth, I know maybe if I go to Namibia, I can help develop the ICT. I know maybe when I go to uh, Mauritius, I can help develop a certain pattern of manufacturing systems or industry. So you identify from all these 54 African countries their needs or who reported their, their uh, tariff lines and see how best you can create, come out of a product, either finished product or other services. This is the way businesses should tap into the benefits of African continental free trade. Fantastic. So thank you for the overview of what AFTA means for African businesses. So if we look at it from a different perspective, what does AFTA mean for international businesses outside of Africa? Well, the African continental free trade, even though the name goes with Africa, does not mean it's limited to Africa. Yes. We have partnership agreements. And let me emphasize the partnership agreements are not a way saying that bring your products and it will not go through duties. No. Or to go through preferential treatment. No. Countries can continue to have bilateral trade agreements with outside uh, the free trade. And these partnership agreements are supposed to be maybe outside the tariff lines. For example, if Ghana want to have a bilateral agreement with a country, say, X in UK. Maybe we can focus on input manufacturing products, things that we have not producing here in terms of maybe manufacturing input, high hardware advanced. Well, those ones you can. But products that are being manufactured here among member states, the agreement will not accept. And so, yes, and when you come to open up business here on an African soil, once the goods are produced from here, using about 60% of our raw materials and some raw materials from outside, it's going to still receive the originating status of a made in Africa product to attract tariff free. So yes, we still have that partnership open. Thank you for that, Lewis. So you've detailed there in terms of partnership agreements and the expectations with regards to international companies or international businesses looking to come into Africa and, you know, realise some of the potential or advantages of AFTA. One thing I wanted to discuss with you today was at the beginning of the year, we saw the announcement of the signing of the AFTA Adjustment Facility. What is the significance of the fund in the overall mission of AFTA? Yes, it's very, very important. As I said earlier, I think that because of the loss of revenue initially for liberalization, a lot of these countries who are struggling already in the economies will have shortfalls in their revenue generation. Therefore, the adjustment facility fund are in two phases. They are to support such countries or such companies. So countries that are struggling initially, we, they are going to have what we call the concessional support as part of the adjustment facility. Then we're also going to have what we call the technical support. Uh, so the fund will go through as a means of technical support to these countries. Then we have the general under the adjustment, uh, the adjustment facility fund, which has to do with uh, supporting companies, private companies, and the government. In fact, this is not to make up for budget losses. No, it's supposed to support the revenue losses that are accrued due to liberalization. So one is towards uh, government concessions that they lost through supporting them with credit funding. And then the other is through private companies who want to export and they need certain uh, capacity building and certain cushion. This is what the adjustment facility is going to do. And it's very important 
like I said earlier, $1 billion have been secured to support SMEs. That will fall under this uh, sc- this uh, scheme. So you mentioned in terms of the phases of the adjustment facility, loss of revenue and support on companies with trade and within after. One thing which I've noticed is that a lot of the conversations around after is with regards to big business, big companies, cross-border trading. But we know small-scale cross-border trading activities account for a significant amount of regional trade in Africa. Is there anything in the AFTA agreement that addresses and protects the interest of small-scale cross-border traders? Exactly. Initially, remember I made mention the fact that 90% of the product that will be liberalized, you have 10% that are not. Yes. And that 10%, you have the sensitive product, 7%, and then 3% exclusives. So therefore, in every country, you are supposed to identify which are your sensitive products, which are your exclusive products, and we call them no-go zone areas. Okay. You know, so those are products that are supposed to support startups, supposed to support uh, growing industries, and so you don't liberalize those with them for a period of a long time until you develop the, your, your, your market there. So that is the, 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 the agreement position to protect those kind of growing industries or those kind of startups. A lot of this trade happens in the informal sector. It's offline. How do we go about integrating offline and online trade channels in Africa through AFTA? One of the protocols that have yet to be developed is what we call the digital trade. The digital trade will be is still under negotiations. And when it's done, it will spell out all the various analysis under which online and offline trading will go. However, in terms of information, the AFTA Secretariat have developed what we call the Africa Trade Observatory. Okay. The Africa Trade Observatory is supposed to be like a website for all information flow on AFTA, especially trading. How would you know which country has this goods to liberalize, which countries do not, and which countries have changed their goods po- goose position? This is what I think by this time it should be ready, the Africa of the Trade Observatory. So this is how it's going to be, but when the Negotiations on digital trade is over. It is going to uh, spell out all the various uh, parameters by which it will be implemented. Brilliant. So you've kind of detailed there how we can go about integrating offline and online trading with regards to after. So from your point of view, how important is technology in the development and deployment of after? After that is enormous and immensely. That is why ICT has been liberalized under trading services, because you cannot have some value or finished products with value without technology. It's impossible. And we have to move from the primary stages, secondary stages, to the advanced stages of technology. And so a lot of technology firms should be set up in Ghana, in, in the whole Af- in, in among member states. We must really spend a lot in developing the technology infrastructure in our respective countries because it's dynamic, it keeps changing. And this, the better you do and the better you do for modification, it's better than being at where you are. Because countries that are going to really spend a lot of budgets on ICT will have a lot of their finished products really are ready in the market. We look at it. That's why Africa have, we have uh, import uh, deficits. Because a lot of these technology advanced products are being sold to us. We cannot export the same. And so why don't we spend much? We have always training our people, but some of them are finished. They have the skills that they don't have the, the infrastructure, the tools, the devices to work with. So this is the gap we need to really bridge. And so it's very important. Technology ICT is among the first five that was liberalized under the trading services. Thank you for that piece of information, Lewis. So you mentioned about the change in dynamics and also the importance of technology. If we look at recent events with regards to changing dynamics, whether it's Africa or globally, what impact has the pandemic had on the implementation and direction of AFTA? The agreement trading was supposed to start first week, uh, 2020, around 2020. 
but that whole year was a lockdown. The world went on a lockdown. Yes. So it delayed, and it was trading started 2021. A lot of productive bases were disrupted in um, Africa. It really caused a lot of recessions. The pandemic has taught us that we have to fast track the health protocol because it is very important we start looking at vaccine production and developing our pharmaceuticals. And I'm happy that after Secretariat has identified pharmaceutical and vaccine as one of their priority agenda for 2022. And so, yes, businesses were really impacted negatively. And, and I'm happy that, well, some businesses were resilient through alternative way of trading through online and digital entrepreneurship. But we might not know our next pandemic. And so I think most countries have also started developing Center for Diseases. And the African Center for Disease is also playing an active role in harmonizing all the protocols under health. Fantastic. So if we keep to the theme of, say, outside forces influencing after, so outside of after policy, what are some of the cultural or social trends that you think are shaping after? For instance, you know, I've been pushing for what I call intra-African tourism. Yes. Which has so many phases, cultural, sport, what have you. Tourism, as I said, is also one of the liberalized priority sectors under trading services. And we need to really harness them. For example, the Afriasian Bank um, offered about $500 million to support the creative and tourism space. But a lot of companies are not fully organized to really tap into that fund. And I think that needs to be done because that is very important. It will really integrate our Africa at the agenda 23, where we want an integrated Africa across board. And this is where we can start from. Well, Ghana started something ago. We had the, the year of return, which was very massive. That year of return brought a lot of what we call the cis region, the diaspora. We contributed a lot in terms of our, our revenue at the time. And most of them, we are done what we call the year beyond the return, where they are coming to really stay, to develop, to invest. And so we need to look at that kind of retracing our, our tourism, which embedded with culture, embedded with our roots, embedded with our origins, wherever we find ourselves. It's going to go according to that line if we continue to boost intra-African tourism through these uh, basic uh, sub-protocols that I've mentioned. And we didn't have to travel outside Africa to always uh, pay hard currency to rather integrate to the system there whilst we leave ours. There are about five tourist destinations in Africa. How many of us have been patronized? Even in, in Nigeria itself, they have the cattle range, and that cattle range is so important, so sophisticated, but I don't know how many people have been traveled there. So yes, it's very important. I agree 100%. I believe tourism and the creative sector are huge drivers of trade and investment in, sometimes overlooked within Africa. So you talked about the importance of tourism and the creative sector, and you also mentioned the year of return in Ghana and how that has shaped future investment and trade within Ghana. So if we keep to that theme, where do you see after in five years time and what role would it have played in the economic development of the continent? Well, in five years, I'm even looking at about seven years more, seven years, because let's be honest with ourselves, unless we employ serious technology and open our borders, then our benefits will accrue from 10 years to come. Why? Because most countries are liberalizing over a 10 year period. Some are liberalizing over a five year period. So if you are liberalizing onto zero tariff over a reduced period, then what, what benefit do you expect to have before those years? You say you are ready to let tariffs be reduced to zero in 10 years' time. Then why do you want to benefit before 10 years? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Very true. That is, that is not possible. And the real truth and the hard fact is that AFTA can really take up a big shape in seven to 10 years' time. But if we really develop our technology to add value to our regional value chain, then I think in five years we can make great steps. 
I agree 100%. So if we look closer to home, where do you see yourself and the network in terms of the work that you're doing in five years' time? For us, we are three years now and we've already taken Africa. In the same five years to come, we are building what we call the, the APN city, where we're going to have developed talent mobility for our youth. Brilliant. Develop what we call serious policy centers, not just policy centers, where you come out of that city, you are receive capacity building, and you receive seed money to start your entrepreneurship. That is where we are going. And we foresee that we would have pushed for our Africa globalized investment across the African countries more. And investors would have scattered across Africa because we pushed that event. And we do, do not do only the event, we monitor and establish a relationship with our investors and their countries of origin, and then the institutions. This year, we will be, our happiness is that the US trade of commerce are in talks with us to see how they urge most of their traders or investors to support and come. And so we, we, we are going to lead the private space, lead the private space, and then make sure that some of the opportunities and benefits of after will be reaped way ahead of time. That is where we're going. Fantastic. That's great to hear that you're actually preparing for now and actually equipping and upskilling the future generations to, I guess, take over the mantle and drive the after strategy for years to come. Exactly. Quote of the week. As people or as African people, we often have quotes, mantras, African proverbs or affirmations that keep us going when times are hard. Do you have one that you can share with us today, Lewis? Yes, in our uh, Ghanaian palace, Ghanaian proverb, we say that say ofu du ya pa and ye piao. Say ofu du ya pa and ye piao. Meaning, when you climb a good tree, you will be pushed to climb well. It means that any venture initiative that is worth helping, once you come out with a vision, you will get helpers to support you. Fantastic. And I guess that rings true and it kind of matches the ethos and the approach when it comes to after. It's all about collaboration. It's all about working together. Exactly. 100%. That's a beautiful way to close. So, you know, as we're coming to the end of the conversation, do you have any closing remarks and final calls to action? Well, I thank you for having me. I look forward that we'll engage more businesses in the UK. Brilliant and the rest of the world to have frequent programs, frequent capacity building, frequent trading opportunities to see that after becomes a, a, an ongoing process, not just a one-time event. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you for your time. You know, that has been an extremely informative and comprehensive conversation. Very detailed with some extremely valuable pieces of insight and some gems that you've shared. So thank you for your time. I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for sharing your expert knowledge with us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Enjoy your day too. Yes, enjoy your day and we will speak soon. Bye-bye. Thank you to everyone who has listened and stayed tuned to the podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, share or tell a friend about it. You can also rate, review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast. Thank you and see you next week for the Unlocking Africa podcast.